Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast with your host, Michael Zapersky, where we take you deep into the world of elite consultants. Hey, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm very excited to have Blair N. joining us. Blair, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Pleasure to be here. So for those who don't know you, Blair, uh, explain what you do. Uh, I am a recovering consultant. I am the CEO of Win Without Pitching. Win Without Pitching is a sales training organization to creative professionals. So creative professionals are those who are in typically design-based businesses. So they own design firms of various stripes or ad agencies, public relations practices, etc. Good. Okay. And what were you doing before? I mean, take us back to when you got started. Uh, what did your career look like? Yeah, so I um, I stumbled into advertising. I was academically expelled from university after one year, and then a really um, low uh, low quality university too. So I I achieved great um, great things academically, and then I went um, I went to a I took a, a community college, a business administration community college program. Really, I was studying billiards. I was kind of, a, I'm trying to paint the picture of kind of a, this wandering, aimless youth. Right. And then I, I found myself armed with a, a piece of paper that wasn't all that valuable in the marketplace. And I kind of stumbled into advertising. So, and when I stumbled into it, it made so much sense to me. Um, I, uh, I immediately fell in love with the business and I worked in advertising for a, about a dozen years or so. And at some point, so I was hired as a suit and account manager and I grew in those positions. And, um, even in my first job when I was 22 years old, the uh, owner of the firm identified that I seemed to have a knack for new business. So he, at 22, six months into, my tenure in the profession, he put me in charge of business development for this independent ad agency that also owned a public relations firm. So, and I fumbled my way through that too. And then, so I went on to work for some of the largest advertising agencies in the world and some of the smallest design firms in the world kind of crossed, across that creative. It's not so much a divide. It was more of a divide back then. They're a lot more blended these days. Mm-hmm. But I worked in the advertising side and the design side doing account management, running offices, and doing business development. And then one day, I wanted to chuck it all and move to the woods, so move to a little village in the middle of uh, the remote mountains of British Columbia. And I needed to find a way to do that. So I decided to decided to launch a consulting practice and when the first iteration of win without pitching was born. So, you know, I was going to ask you about that. Um, you are in a town of about, I believe 1500 people or so about half that it's more like nine, just under 900. Wow. Okay. Surrounded by, by wilderness. Um, yes. how did you get there and, and what are you doing there, Blair? Yeah, great question. And the, my answer really depends on the day you ask me, but I've been here 18 years. I tripped over it when I was uh, an, a much younger man 18 years ago. We were just, my wife and I just had our first child and um, I got it into my head that um, I wanted to live, uh, I want to live in, the, in a little village in the mountains next to water. And I kind of went in search of that place and uh, found Caslow. Um, it was one of many places on a map that I'd circled and we took a quick impromptu vacation and visited all these places and every one I um, arrived at, I said, this this isn't it, this isn't it. And then when we were, Caslo wasn't even on the map, um, so I hadn't circled it, but it's an hour from Nelson, British Columbia, and I got to Nelson and I thought, no, this isn't it. Nelson was really my destination. Mm-hmm. Then the, the next day we were driving up the lake and the lake is 92 miles long. It's called Kootenai Lake. It's home to the largest strain of rainbow trout in the world. And I'm a fisherman, at least in my mind. Mm-hmm. And I, I knew halfway up the lake, I knew that w- whatever was at the end of this road was home. And I pulled into Caslow and said, this is it. So it took us a few years to get back here. But that's really, I became a consultant because I was determined to live mm-hmm. here. And um, I didn't know anything about the main industries here, which are uh, logging and dope growing. And I still know very little about both of those industries, so <clears throat> I decided to start a consulting practice. That's interesting. I mean, you know, some people uh, believe that you you can't be successful in you know in such a such a remote place where you have no direct 
access to you know work face to face with with your clients uh you've made your business work you you've been successful at it how have how have you made it work well it's interesting i mean i would look back on my own experience and argue that um being in such a small market where i don't have a client or even a potential client within hundreds of miles of me i guess that's different now but when i was a consultant initially um we're a training company now and we can talk about that later but initially when i was a consultant um there wasn't I couldn't see anybody within hundreds of miles that would that would hire me. So it forced me to put a stake in the ground. And it's something that we talk about in our training all the time. And I talked about I talk about my books. And when I was a consultant is if you want to expand your geographic reach, you need to narrow your focus because people are willing to travel for expertise, but they're not willing to travel, hire a consultant from the other side of the world or the other part of the continent if they can get the same thing down the street. So that forced me into some decisions around, you know, what I was going to do and the markets that I was going to serve um, and other kind of tangential, tangential decisions around that that you might call decisions of strategy or of positioning. And I think as a result, it's probably contributed uh, to my success substantially. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's interesting to hear you say that because I think of uh, David Baker who, uh, is a good friend of of yours, and you guys run a, a podcast together. Yeah. Um, you both specialize in working with creative agencies or creative professionals. I think many consultants have this mindset that that competition is is bad. That um, you know you want to stay as far away from other consultants or professionals that are doing the same thing uh, as you are, because they may take your ideas or there might be some conflicts there. Uh, but here you and David are, uh, you know, sharing a lot of knowledge together. What would you say to those to people that that are worried about competition? How 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 can they think about it differently? How has it worked for you? Well, I think you know, with so many of the most meaningful or profound ideas in our life, it's um, when we arrive at something that where there's some insight for us, usually we're taking two seemingly opposable ideas and making sense of them. Mm-hmm. And so the idea of competition, you know, competition being bad on, on the one hand, it is if you're surrounded by competitors and, you know, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the eyes of your client, there seem to be little, little difference between you and your competitors, then, then you have a significant business problem. Um, you're undifferentiated. You've got some there's some strategy work that you haven't done. Um, on the other hand, um, positioning or strategy isn't meant to put you into a category of one. If you define yourself so narrowly and build a, an expertise that is so focused that you're the only one who does it, you've probably um, confined yourself to a category or a discipline that's too small. So we're not we're not trying to. You know, in all of these decisions we make around focusing our consulting practices, we're not trying to eliminate all competition, but we are trying to eliminate most of the competition. So there's this duality that good competition is both good and bad. Mm-hmm. And I think once you um, once you kind of successfully define your space, and I I uh, to me there are two core elements: discipline and market. So what do you do, and who do you do it for? And when you when you make the decisions around discipline and market, which together I'll call focus, then that should eliminate all but, you know, maybe a dozen or maybe two dozen competitors, maybe three dozen at the most worldwide. It might be as few. It might get you down to a category of like four or five or six. So somewhere between four or five, six and a few dozen. That's that's a kind of a healthy competitive set in most markets. Now, it varies from market to market, depending on the size, competition, density, et cetera. Um, but when you get to that space and um, you're seen as a leader in that space, then it's probably a good idea to start collaborating with um, others who are in or slightly tangential to that space. And, you know, when it comes to David and I, we are friends, we're collaborators and we're also competitors. And I think for the most part, we um, <clears throat> we. Uh, we're happy to lose business to each other. We refer business to each other. We tend to, both of us, do the right thing for the client. 
And if it's the right thing for the client to hire him as a consultant or to enter our training program, we're both comfortable making that recommendations because we I think we're comfortable with our place in the market that we serve. And we feel like we're both stronger if we work together. So I'm not I don't actually play nice with everybody, like to the extent that I do with David. We're aligned philosophically as well. And that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. I have an overarching point of view on how. Creative services, in fact, all all consultative services should be sold, and it's right there in the name of our business, win without pitching. I don't believe you should be relegated to the vendor position. I don't believe that you should participate in these dog and pony shows where you're lined up in an apples to apples comparison against your peers. You're invited to come in and solve the client's problem as proof of your ability to solve the problem. And I don't believe you have to sell that way. So um, somebody else has to believe the same thing for me to be a collaborator with them. Right. So your business uh, is built on the idea of win without pitching, uh, right? Many creative agencies pitch their uh, kind of their, their way to win business. Uh, you're opposed to, to that and have a very clear positioning around that. What, what are then some ways that uh, the consultants, creative professionals, you know, anyone in professional services, can can take what steps can they start to take to differentiate themselves so that they are positioned in a in a way where they have a greater chance of of winning business. Yeah, so it starts with, and I'm sure you cover this in your own training program, but it starts with focus, right? So what do you, what are you going to be a consultant on? Who are you going to be a consultant to, and on what issues? You know this. We've all met generalist management consultants who will <clears throat> who will propose to do everything for everybody and that's a that's a difficult sell because you can't it's it's a you can't build deep extra expertise in any one area and you know there are the alan weiss's of the world and i don't know who the more modern day equivalents of alan weiss would be but that are the exceptions that prove the rule but i remember you know back when and i don't even mean to diminish alan's current status i don't know much about what he's doing right now but back in the day when i was paying a lot of attention to him he'd published 600 articles and 13 books or something and you know it just appeared that here was a guy who could come in he knew the process of consulting and could come in um and consult of almost anybody on anything at least that's the that's the uh, impression that he conveyed and uh, and uh, it may have been entirely correct but i think for the rest of us mortals um, we probably w want to become subject matter experts rather than process experts. Um, and those two things aren't mutually exclusive, but those are the two types of consultants you tend to see. And to be a subject matter expert, you really do need to narrow your focus. And I'm sure David Baker talked about this, like start solving the same types of problems over and over again, because it's it's that repetitive observation, repeated observation, repeated problem solving that allows you to see the patterns that that is the basis for your expertise. So you differentiate yourself by narrowing your focus, again, discipline for market, so that it's just narrow enough that it forces you to go deeper and you you go you build deep expertise again by solving the same types of problems so that you can see the patterns. Mm -hmm. So a client comes along and says, Oh my God, I've got this situation. I don't I, I don't know what it is or what to do. And you're, you're, I don't even know if you can help me. And the consultant says, well, it looks like your challenge is X. You, <clears throat> you're presenting these symptoms. I've seen this about 30 times before or whatever the number is. My initial hypothesis is this. Have, have these three things happened to you in the last six months? You know, that's, you can only do that if you have deep expertise. You can only build deep expertise if you begin by narrowing your focus. So it starts there. Good. That's, I think that's a really great response and a lot for people to, to think about and, and work through. Um, you know, Blair, I, I'm wondering, but we're talking about uh, very clear steps that people can kind of take and, and think through. Uh, and we'll explore a little bit more about kind of where your business is at right now. But along the way, along this path that you've been on in this journey, what kind of, you know, what stands out for you as maybe a, a challenge um, that that really, you know, if you look back on, you say to yourself, wow, I maybe could have handled that differently, or it's something that I'd like others to learn from as well. If you just kind of look at your career in building your consulting business, now a training company, is there one challenge that really stands out for your one big learning experience? 
Well, probably the most recent big one. So it would be sometime in the last five years, and I've been doing this about 18 years, um, <clears throat> the first 13 or so as a consultant and the last five or so as a training company. I made the pivot to oh, – I can't believe I just said that word. I made the switch from <clears throat> um, a consulting practice to a training company when I started to go deep into the subject of value pricing. Mm-hmm. And I, I realized that for a consultant, for a proper consultant, to, and you know, that's not that's not even fair because there's so many different ways to go about being a consultant, as, as you know. But I felt like if I were going to go deep into my clients' businesses, solve you know, the biggest problems with the highest degree of certainty and create the most value, I felt like I really needed to value price my engagements. I needed to be do more work up front in the kind of the diagnostic phase to assess really what the problems were and then construct an engagement that was very specific to that client and to their to their needs and their goals. And so that's how I realized that's how it should be done. But what I was doing is I had absent mindedly almost right from the beginning, I had absent mindedly begun to quasi productize my business. Hmm. And I'm more about that. What, what do you mean? <clears throat> yeah, you, you, I mean, you, it's, uh, it's probably a spectrum, but it's helpful to think of it as an either or situation where you have productized services businesses and you have customized services businesses. And in a, a typical consulting practice is a customized service business where every new client is a blank slate of possibilities. And so as a salesperson, as a consultant slash salesperson, when you're assessing the client and the engagement, you shouldn't be thinking about solutions at all. You should be asking questions around business objectives, around measures, around the value that the client wants to create. You want to uncover the desired future state of the client. And once you uncover all these things and you quantify it, then you would have the money, the value conversation and figure out you know, how much money the client's willing to invest to get to this desired future state. You apply some sort of murky math around an, an uncertainty discount. How certain am I, the consultant, that I'll be able to get them to this state and then discount based on your level of uncertainty. And then you would put forward some uh, some options for the client to engage you to solve those problems and essentially at different risk levels and let the client choose their risk level. That's and and um and and then it's really only after you've had the money conversation, the value conversation, that you really should start thinking about solutions. But when you productize, you think, oh, I'll create this product and I'll call it the um, I'll call it the business development audit. Then I'll call it the I forget what I called it now. It's all purged it all from my memory. So I would have these different um, platforms or levels of offering kind of off the shelf. Mm-hmm. And I could have published them on my website. I didn't, but I put them together in a PDF and I would send them to the client. It would basically with every client, it would be, well, do you want vanilla, chocolate or strawberry? Here are the three different options. Here are the three different prices. And now I know I've got a book on pricing coming out in a few weeks. And um, I know that just that violates the first rule of pricing or my first rule of pricing, which is always price the client. So in a customized services business, your focus is on the client and the value you might create for the client by helping to get them to their desired future state. And then you arrive at a price and then you start thinking it's about solutions. Productize, you do it the other way around. Um, and I think there's something appealing about productizing your services when you're in a consultative services business, but it's a it's a bad move. You end up in this mushy middle, neither productized nor customized. And when you start adding staff, if you do start adding staff, you run into all kinds of problems. You have culture problems because you can't actually do both in the same business. The cultures of the two different types of of organizations are so entirely different. A productized service business is about efficiencies and scale and a finite number of offerings at set prices. Customized service business is um, you're not even thinking about solutions until you've had a value conversation. You have to limit your client client base because there's only so many clients you can take on at any one time. And it's not likely to exceed like 12 or 15, even in the largest consulting company. In a productized services company, we've got over 100 firms in our in our training um, uh, program right now. 
But as a consultant, I couldn't work with more than three, maybe four, depending on the nature of the engagements. So they're two completely different businesses. Most consultants should be in the customized service business. A lot of us find ourselves quasi-productizing our our services for reasons that really aren't clear to us, that we haven't thought through and we haven't thought through the implications. So that would be the big thing I would say is just ask yourself, are you um, either intentionally or unintentionally, are you uh, productizing or semi-productizing your services when you really should stay a customized services firm? And so the decision for, for you to take you know your firm uh, to a, as you call it, a training company uh, where there is a lot more productization of, of the training, it would seem. To tell me more about that. What, what does that now look like and, and what was the, the decision or the impetus for you to do that? While we work with a lot of seasoned and experienced consultants here at Consulting Success, I'm often contacted by new early stage consultants. Invariably, the question I'm asked is, what are the steps I should take to become a successful consultant and grow my consulting business to my first six figures per year? Well, I'm excited to announce that we've opened the doors for our Momentum program. This is our most popular program for early stage consultants, and it has helped almost 1,000 consultants to start, run, and grow successful consulting businesses. It gives you the step-by-step plan to help you with your messaging, your fees, and pricing strategies, how to win more proposals, how to go to market more effectively, developing a marketing system to generate leads consistently, and so much more. And right now, until September the 19th, you can sign up for Momentum and get 50% off the regular price by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio, A-U-D-I-O. Only 100 spots are available to join Momentum and get 50% off. This deal is only available until September the 19th or until all 100 spots are gone. We won't be opening up new spots in this program for several months. So don't wait. Go to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. A-U-D-I-O. Yeah, so the decision was I realized I was pricing and constructing my engagements all wrong. And for me to do it properly, I probably needed to be in engagements where I could say to a client at some point in the middle, you know what, I'll be there the day after tomorrow. Um, and given where I live, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I used to say we're just outside of Vancouver. We're a nine hour drive from Vancouver. So mm-hmm. I can't get anywhere tomorrow. Right. I'm going to Dublin uh, next week. I'm going to San Francisco in a couple of days, and I'm going to Dublin next week. It's about the same amount of time for me to go <laughs> to San Francisco or to Dublin. Right. So it doesn't matter where I go. It's at, it's at least a day to get somewhere. So plus I had um, youngish kids at the time, and I just thought, you know, I can't, I can't see, I can't. I'm, I said I'm either going to do consulting properly, and I'm going to value price these highly customized engagements or I'm going to fully productize. So it made sense for me to go the other way and fully productize. And so what kind of impact has that had on your business since since doing that? Well, the first thing is it had a significant impact on my health because I felt like I had pushed the independent consulting model as far as I could go. Mm-hmm. I had in 2012, the last year that I was a consultant, I got sick four times on three continents, just n- not serious, but just like run down. And the last one in November, I was flat on my back in bed with pneumonia for two weeks. And I thought, you know what? I I was thinking through all these things and I was thinking, okay, it's time to make the shift. Uh, This business model is killing me. Now, if I look back on that and I think my revenue was probably, uh, it wasn't 400. So it was just me. I think I had a bit of admin support at the time. My revenue wasn't 400,000. It was probably three, maybe three and a half. And And I thought, well, this is as far as you can go. And, you know, that's just so not true. There's so many independent consultants making so much more than that. So Mm -hmm. a big a big part of why I was I was working as hard as I could and I was kind of maxing out revenue wise. And I wanted to grow revenue. The only way I knew how to do it was to work harder. Really, I needed to price differently, change my engagements. I probably could have doubled that number and reduced the amount of work if travel were easier for me. Um. But it was in that moment, lying flat on my back in bed for two weeks with pneumonia, I decided, no, I'm going the other way. I'm going to pursue scale. I'm going to hire coaches. Um, 
And it's been a it's been a fantastic. I loved being a consultant. I absolutely and I joke about being a recovered consultant. I absolutely loved it, and I'm glad I did it for um, a dozen years or whatever it was. And I'm loving owning a productized service business, a training company where culture is so important. Where hire we hire people. I've got a I'm responsible for these people. I'm responsible for morale and strategic vision and. And my wife, who's the operations person, is just excels at all of the accountability stuff and systems. So I'm really enjoying it. And it's um, how many I'm people do you have working with you on your team now? We're uh, in head office, which is in the remote mountain village of Caslow, BC. We are four. Okay. And then we have a full time coach in Seattle, and then we have part time coaches in New York and Raleigh, North Carolina. And then we've got a we've got a new level to the model where we're licensing some consultants next year all around the world, and that that's going to start in March. Blair, if, if you were to start a brand new professional services business today, uh, what would be the first thing that you would do to to get clients? Oh, great question, because it's changed so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, when I did new business for, um, a design firm was my last employer, I was hired to run a regional office. And so this would have been 1999, I think. And, um, they said, I moved in and the guy was running the office. All the clients were friends. So they left. So there was no clients. And I had a, basically a blank slate. And I said to the uh, owner of the firm, I said, you know, um, I'm a writer. I, I write. So. This might take a little while. I'll, I'll make some calls, but I just moved to that market. I didn't know very many people. I'll make some calls, but I'm a writer. I'm going to start writing. So I started writing, you know, content or thought leadership. We probably called it educational marketing back then. And I, mm-hmm. I started faxing it to people because email was just coming <laughs> online. Right. And, and then I started emailing people and my open rates were over 70%, seven zero. That, that was back in the day. If you got an email, it was novel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, so I would absolutely write, I would, I would continue to write. Now everybody writes, everybody creates content. So one of the things that's absolutely vital, I talked about the importance of narrowing your, you want to become an expert, you need to narrow your, your focus. And that's a combination of discipline and market. But the next level is you need to have a point of view and the denser, um, the denser kind of the competitive space. So that's taking into account the size of the market, the number of clients, and then the size of your, com- the number of competitors. So the more competitive your space is, the more vital it is that you have a polarizing point of view. So whatever market I decided, first I would choose the market, discipline for market, and then I would arrive at a, a, a contrary point of view. A, a way of looking at doing X for Y, discipline for market, that that um, eschews or even runs in the face of, flies in the face of the standard conventions of that space. And if I couldn't come up with something, if I couldn't come up with a novel model, a novel way of looking at the problems in this space, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even try. I would go somewhere else mm. because that that's the secondary level of different differentiation where. When you choose a discipline for market, you, you, uh, uh, the number of com- competitors, consultants you would compete against goes from uh, thousands down to maybe, you know, a dozen or dozens. And then that last battle, how you compete with those few remaining ones, you want to make that a battle of ideology. You want to make people, people will read or come to your thought leadership, whether it's a podcast or a, a webinar or a speech or a, a post video, whatever it is. They'll come for the content, you talking about X for Y, discipline for market, but they will hire you for your point of view. So if you cannot come up with an overarch, and it's a, a it's not absolutely mandatory. Like there are lots of successful businesses out there who don't have an overarching point of view. But if you can come up with one, mm-hmm. it is so much more powerful, so much more compelling. I think Simon Sinek, he's got a bunch of great quotes. The one I can never remember it perfectly, but it's um, don't look to sell to people who want to buy mm-hmm. what you have. Look to sell to people who believe what you believe. Mm. So somebody reads your article, your blog post, and they came for the information on X for Y, discipline for market, but they're moved by your point of view and they react. You're looking for 
one of two reactions. They seem like the opposite, but essentially they're the same reaction. And the first one is, uh, oh, you think about these things the same way that I do. Mm -hmm. and, and by implication, not everybody else thinks about things this way. You and I are kind of brothers that way. We think about things the same way. And the other reaction that is equally as powerful is, oh, my God, I've never thought about this this way before. Mm -hmm. So you need that combination of discipline for market. And then if you can add in that perspective, that point of view that's diff that separates you from everybody else, those are the like <clears throat> that's the foundation of, a, of a, a business that will be successful. So you've written the articles uh, or you know created the content, then. How do people get it out? What, what in, in your experience, what would your recommendation be to, to get it out there? I mean, if they don't have a big social following already, uh, what, what's an effective way for people to then get that content they've created in, in front of uh, ideal clients? Yeah, so um, we've been teaching this for about five years. And as, as we review the curriculum every year, there's something that on that front where we're in our, in our lead generation, we call it expert lead generation term. There's a point that we used to make loosely and then we made it more strongly. And now it's this front and center. And it's this idea of take all of your lead generation or your marketing chips and put them on one square. Make go all in on not entirely all, but pick a major and then a minor. So the major might be. I'm going to write a book. Now, that takes a while, right? Mm -hmm. But you publish a book, and then the minor in support of that might be speaking in support of the book. The major might be a podcast, right? And the minor might be, I don't know, something tied to the podcast. The major might be the blog, right? It might mm -hmm. be just Twitter. Like, what's the one thing that you are going to do, and you're going to try to dominate that channel? What's worked best in your own business? Well, I just started writing um, because that's what I knew what to do. And I think when I published my first book, The Win Without Pitching Manifesto, seven and a half years ago, up until then, I wrote regularly um, every month minimum. And I did a one-year experiment where I wrote every week. Um, but that book has been out seven and a half years, and it's uh, it's always sold steadily and it's always climb like it's almost like it's on this exponential it's not exponential but it's on a steep curve right now like in the first six half of six months of this year it outsold all of last year last year it outsold all the year before and this is a book that's seven and a half months old so that has served me seven and a half years old seven, sorry seven and a half years old right yeah and so what are you doing to to promote that book yeah not much anymore <laughs> it's just kind of gaining gaining steam. It's getting reviews. It's getting, you know, showing up in in yeah. search on Amazon or something like that. Well, I think the success of that book, at least in part, is the fact that it's targeted to the creative professions. Mm -hmm. So it's and so it's a small world, right? And especially if you if you parse it by vertical, um, where people talk to each other, it's I'm fortunate that it's a it's a book that's kind of um, well referenced and commonly known within the market that I serve. And if I weren't so vertically focused, if I were focused on a discipline and the market, I just define the market in some other way other than a vertical mm -hmm. that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be getting that kind of uh, like water cooler talk, the sharing that mm -hmm. happens in a vertical space. So I've been lucky that way. I also, when I, when I published the book initially, um, I decided to give it away for free on my website and I, I, I'd seen a few people do this before and I reached out to them and said, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And some of them said, don't do it. And some of them said, do it. And so you can read my book, the one without pitching manifesto on win without pitching.com for free. Now you have to click a lot and we've done that in, on purpose. So it's like you read a first, a page, you click, you read a page, you click, mm -hmm. There's a lot of clicking. And at some point, you just give up and go pay $8 for the Kindle version <clears throat> uh, or $25 for the hardcover. So I think that strategy has served well. And also, a few years ago, we started gating that. We just said, okay, you can read it for free, but hand, hand over your email address. And so we probably get 150 people a month who are just handing over their email address so they could read it for free. And then I don't know what percentage go on to buy the book. 
Um, and I, I don't really, I'm not very good at tracking what happens from there, but that book has served us well. I think that's a, a great case study, an example of <clears throat> the, the importance of specialization and, and focus, um, you know, playing out here in real life uh, with you, Blair. So you, you have a new book that will likely be available by the time that we publish this podcast episode. Uh, what's it all about? And in addition to that, what's the best way for people to, to learn more about, you know, your work, your book and, and what you're up to? Yeah, I'll start with that last one first. Winwithoutpitching.com. I'm also Blair Ends on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm, I'm not on Facebook. Um, the book is called the new book. It's it's uh, ships on December 6th. It will be available for pre-order um, as soon as November 16th. It's called Pricing Creativity: A Guide to Profit Beyond the Billable Hour, and it's really a, a, it's a, it's available in three formats. There's an ebook. There's a manual version that is essentially the ebook printed, broken up into sections with an added section called Tools. And I I conceived of this and wrote it as a manual because I imagined that anybody in the creative professions or even it's really meant to go beyond that. Anybody in consultative services of any kind who who is working on a sale and engagement that they want to price, they would pull this off the shelf. They would reread a couple of key principles. They would refamiliarize themselves with the six rules of pricing creativity. They would look up some of the specific tips if they had some specific issues that they were dealing with about this proposal or this sale. And then they would pull, flip to the tools section and actually start writing in and crafting their options and prices right in the book. So that's the manual version. And then there's um, um, there's the um, enhanced manual version that comes with four hours of video lessons and support. It's only available for sale on my website, winwithoutpitching.com. If you go to pricingcreativity.com, that will redirect you to. But again, those that page doesn't go live until November 15th. Love it. Good stuff, Blair. Well, really appreciate you coming on here, uh, sharing you know your story and uh, what you've gone through and what you're up to. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, so thank you. Thank you, Michael. I really appreciate that. Thanks. Are you ready to take your consulting business to the next level? Learn more about the Accelerator Coaching Program at consultingsuccess.com.